Hello, friends. What an honor it is to interview Olivia Campbell, a journalist and author specializing in medicine and women, about her new book, Women in White Coats, How the First Women Doctors Changed the World of Medicine. Amazing, right? I'm journalist, author, and producer of Incandescent Radio and Incandescent TV, Hope Katz Gibbs, and I'm thrilled to be here to interview this truly amazing woman for our Authors Between the Covers show on Incandescent Radio and TV. Olivia will also be our cover story in the March-April 2022 issue of Incandescent Women magazine, where we are going to feature women pioneers in celebration of International Women's Month in March. So welcome, Olivia. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, you're great. So Olivia is in Philly, where I grew up. I'm in New Mexico. I love Zoom because we could be everywhere all at the same time. And I know you're going to love her. Her work has appeared in The Guardian, The Washington Post, The New York Magazine, and The Cut, among so many, so many others. But before we get into our Q&A, let me tell you a little bit about this fabulous, amazing book that I had the privilege of meeting Olivia because uh, Costco Magazine, who I've been writing for since 1996, if you can believe it, hired me to do a feature on her. And that is coming out this month in March of 2022. So be sure to check out this month's F F uh, issue of the Costco Connection because Olivia and my article will be featured there. But this book is the remarkable story of three Victorian women who broke down barriers in the medical field to become the first women doctors, revolutionizing the way women receive healthcare. So Olivia, take us back to the early 1800s women were dying in large numbers from treatable diseases because they avoided receiving Medicare. Please tell us why. Uh, and examinations before by male doctors were often demeaning and painful. So in addition, like women faced a stigma from illness and because the diagnosis could significantly limit their ability to find husbands, jobs, or be received in polite society. So that's just crazy. <laughs> so tell, take us back and tell us what was going on. It, it was bleak, um, <laughs> my, you know, I don't want to sugarcoat it. It was, it was not good. I mean, this was before we, we knew about germs, before we knew about where disease really came from, before we knew about how um, people could catch diseases. Uh, so there was a lot of wrong theories going around about why people got sick, how they got sick, how, you know, how and, and why it could be transferred or not. Um, and, and for women, especially, you know, there's this impropriety thing, this how it was improper for male doctors to even, you know, look at your nether regions, you know, they're, and they're not, they're not actually looking at you. Um, so they're not finding what's wrong, right? They're, they're not going to see all they need to see, because they're not looking. Um, <laughs> So it, and a lot of times that they were just making women more uncomfortable to, to go there. So women just would stop going. Like they would, they would go to find relief and these men would just make it worse and make them feel bad. Um, you know, there was stigma around um, sexually transmitted diseases, of course, uh, but there was also stigma around really any kind of disease because they didn't know where disease was coming from. You know, they thought you were kind of marked basically, you know, you were, you were a sinner was, you know, one idea that it's like a religious thing. Um, you know, you had bad genes, so no one would want to marry you um, because your, your kids are going to be sickly or you're not going to be able to have kids, that kind of thing. So there was there was a lot going on for women at this time. And they really uh, they really needed women doctors to talk to. When these women finally came on the scene, they they all these women the accounts of women saying things like I could finally talk to this person and they could understand where I was coming from. And they, they, you know, they, they had an understanding as a woman themselves, but also that I felt open and, and able to talk to them in ways that I would never be able to talk to my male doctor. It's really unthinkable. You know, I mean, we can't imagine what it would be like to not have medical care as women. I mean, you know, midwives, just, there's so much honoring of us now. But so this book talks about um, three women motivated by personal loss and frustration under this ridiculously inadequate Medicare system, medical system, Elizabeth Blackwell, Elizabeth Garrett uh, Anderson, and Sophia Jex Black. And they fought for a women's place in the male dominated medical field. And it was tough stuff to get them there. So talk about these amazing women who really changed history and what it's like to be alive for a woman. So Elizabeth Blackwell was kind of the first, the, the original trailblazer. She was the first woman in America to earn an MD, the first practicing um, licensed woman. There were other 
female practitioners in the US, but they, none of them had MDs because no schools would allow them. Um, so they would be practicing like alternative medicine, um, homeopathy, that kind of thing. But she, so Elizabeth Blackwell wanted to be the first, you know, legitimate, I have a, a Western medical degree doctor. Um, she was told by friends, you know, you should go to France and dress as a man to get a degree. She's like, no, that's, that's, you know, that's not the point. The point is to be a woman getting a degree. So she, cause she's applying to all these colleges and no one's accepting her. She's like, you know, there, this is the time when uh, medical colleges are kind of coming on the scene in America and pl- proliferating more. There's, you know, a few colleges in cities, but now you're seeing country colleges pop up. So there's a, a relatively, um, a lot, a lot of colleges for her to apply to. So she, she literally like, you know, was applying everywhere. And for men at the time, it was really just like, you, you just said you wanted to come and they would say, okay, basically it wasn't really like an application <laughs> that you had that was very serious or anything. So, but just because you were a woman, there's, they would say no, basically. Um, so when she finally was accepted at this one college, it was as a joke, the, the um, administrators at the college, uh, said, well, we don't want to be the ones to say no to a woman. So we're going to put it to the, uh, the students. So they, they go to the, all the students and they're like, okay, so there's a woman who's applied. Do you think we should let her in? The students think it's a practical joke being played by one of the, their like rival local uh, you know, medical schools. So they're like, oh yeah, sure. She can come. That's great. And so a few weeks later, here's this actual woman who appears at the school and they were like, oh man, she's free. <laughs> So, so that's the only reason she finally got accepted was because they thought it was a joke. So she wasn't a joke. She was for real. And, you know, they tried to pick on her while she was at school and she wouldn't have it. You know, she, they would throw stuff at her. She'd just brush it off. And she, she really stood her ground and said, I'm going to take all the classes I need to take. You're not going to shut me out of these anatomy classes that you think I'm too delicate for. I'm going to, I'm going to do it all. And she did. And she got, she got her degree. Um, so Elizabeth Garrett Anderson meets Elizabeth Blackwell on when she's on a lecture tour in London. So um, and inspires her to pursue uh, medical education. And Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, who I refer to as Lizzie in the book, because we have two Elizabeths here, it was it was tricky. Um, <laughs> most of her family called, called her Lizzie, so I thought that was okay. Uh, but yeah, Lizzie had a terrible time. She um, a lot of medical schools in the UK are connected to a hospital. So what she would do is she would go be a trainee nurse and then she would be like, hey, can I take a class? This one class over here. They're like, okay, fine. And she'd be like, hey, can I take this other class too? So, you know, eventually they would catch on and kick her out. So she did this a couple different hospitals. She's just like bopping around trying to get all the credits she needs, basically build them up. And um, whenever she gets kicked out, she um, has one of the, the professors that's like on her side will come and give her like tutoring privately to get her the credits for these other classes that she needs. She gets licensure through a loophole um, through uh, the Society of Apothecaries. So she becomes a licensed physician, the first woman licensed in the UK to practice medicine. She's not an MD yet, technically. She does that later. She goes to Paris later on, get get to be an official MD. Um, But she she is licensed and and legally practicing, uh, you know, before that. Um, So Sophia, comes along later she's younger she's um she's got a lot of energy she's she's feisty she's raring to go she's this you know she's fat she's a lesbian she's a loud mouth she's she's angry i love her more than anyone <laughs> she's just incredible force she she is the heroine in the story in my opinion um she decides she wants to become a doctor. She had met Lizzie years before this, but it was a few years later when she finally decides she wants to become a doctor. She was visiting um, some schools in America. Uh, she had traveled over to see how women are educated in America. She, she wanted to start her own school for women in the UK. And she wanted, there's a lot more women being educated in the US than there was in the UK at this point. So she came to like places like Oberlin College, one of the first um, co-ed colleges in the US. So while she's here, she comes to um, a women's medical school and hospital in Boston and decides that, okay, she wants to become a doctor. So she returns um, back home to England and she applies to the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And uh, can I take a few classes? Would that be okay? And they're like, well, we'd have to have a whole separate, you know, amount of classes for, for women. We can't have you in the men's classes. So, but we, and we can't afford to do that. So no, you can't come. It would be more, you're just one woman. So if, if you had more women, then maybe 
uh, we could we could do something. So she she finds a newspaper editor uh, who publishes a little piece and like, hey, uh, does anyone else want to come to medical school? Any other women interested in this? And she gets a few more women to come and these seven women apply again and they say, hey, uh, can we come down? They're like, oh crap, but, you know, she 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 called us out on our, our bluff there. So they said, okay, yes, you can come. But the, the whole time that they're there, they're like fighting with the school. It is just a huge fight to get the degree. They finish all of the credits that they need to, and the school refuses to award them their degree. So they literally have all the same, um, you know, credits as the men do, but the, and the men are, have their MD and go off and practice. The women, they, they refuse to give them their degree so they can't practice, they're like stuck. Uh, and all the examining boards refuse to have them come and get licensed, take the exams for the MD, all this, this stuff. So they're like, what, what can we do now? We're stuck. And so what <laughs> it, was, it, go, it, was, it was just it goes with your next question is about how, what you know why they founded their own schools it's like they they were like well if this establishment isn't going to let us in we're going to make our own schools you know like fine the, the goal was always that they wanted to be in regular schools regular schools had all of the good professors they have all the um you know, the tools, the, the research museums and libraries, all those, you know, the resources at these established schools, that's what they wanted access to. But because they couldn't, you know, warm their way in, they couldn't get the door open. They said, okay, we're going to make our own school. We're going to do it ourselves. And <laughs> what did they do? It's like, it's a page turner. <laughs> Tell me more. So in New York, uh, Elizabeth Blackwell, she has her medical practice, which expands into a woman's hospital and then expands again into a, um, a college for women attached to her, her hospital. She and her sister, Emily, which they both have MDs. Um, and then the same thing happens in London for, for Lizzie. She's got her little medical practice that expands into a woman's hospital. And then uh, Sophia comes along and says, hey, we didn't get our degrees. We really want to establish our own school in London. Would Would you do this with me. Um, it would look bad, basically, if Sophia opened a women's medical school in London and it didn't have the association of the first, you know, licensed woman MD in London attached to it. Like if she didn't condone it, if she didn't, you know, publicly show her support for it, it wasn't going to probably get off the ground. At this point, Elizabeth Blackwell has also uh, moved to London. She's kind of retired uh, to the UK. She's getting old. She lost uh, the sight in one of her eyes during a medical procedure. Um, so she has trouble with a lot of the, the stuff that she was doing um, at her school. She's mostly likes to do the planning of, of starting the schools and that kind of stuff. So she's really excited to help start the school with Sophia, but you know, they all tell her, okay, we'll do this, but you can't have your name on it, Sophia. You don't have an MD, so you can't be publicly associated with it. It's your idea, it's fine, it's your little baby, but we have to you know, keep you off of it so people won't think that we're having people that are unqualified, you know, working here. So we're not, you know, that was the deal. If you scrub your name, we'll, we'll participate with you, said the other two Elizabeths. So Sophia's like, okay, fine. If that's what it takes, yes, we'll do this. Um, so they start their school and it's, you know, a few years of struggling. And while Sophia is away in Ireland, finally taking the MD exam, but she finally found an examining body that, um, would allow women to come. So she's off taking the exam to, to be finally, you know, officially an MD. Um, and while she's gone, the school board of her school meets and says, I think we need to replace Sophia as like the head. She's not the right kind of person. You know, she's not a good, um, she's not very diplomatic. She's very, she says whatever she wants to say kind of person. And she, you know, she gets angry really quickly. So uh, this is the thing, I don't know. <sighs> People kept saying how how much of a temper she had. I don't know if she had a temper for a woman in the 1800s or if she actually had a temper. You know what I mean? Like, was she really like flying off the handle or was she like behaving more like a man would behave? You know what I mean? That's that's the thing about these accounts. Like, I I like to think she was just a woman who showed her emotions and that wasn't okay. You know, like she she was righteously angry for most of the most of the time. Um, but yeah, so the, the board kicked her out basically while she was gone. It was her idea, her baby. And then the school is known now as Elizabeth Garrett's Anderson School. Um, 
because that's who took over and kind of kept it alive and it, you know it got folded into universities all of these women's medical schools get like folded into other schools so yeah that's that's the sad tale for Sophia and there's so much complicated it's so nuanced and painful and you know these women doing this amazing stuff right so as you were so what gave you this idea and how did you track all this great history down so the first thing I read about this era of women's medicine. I've always been writing about women's medicine, um, but I read about a riot that happened uh, in Philadelphia where I, you know, I live outside of Philly. So I thought it'd be interesting to, to write about, first of all, like, okay, it's local. Um, so the women's medical school in Philadelphia was the second in the country. Um, it was around the 1850s that it was established. So it's it really, you know, it's way back. Um, they had been asking the um, Philadelphia Hospital to come and view the uh, lectures. You know, when they bring in the patients in front, the clinical lectures where they are in like the amphitheater, there's real patients coming and they're showing the students these cases, that kind of thing, little procedures. Um, and the men had been attending these lectures, even men from different colleges all around, they, they come to these lectures and the women have never been allowed. So it, I think the first time um, the woman asked to come, it was uh, it was really early on when she was teaching. And then like for years and years and years, she's pestering this, this hospital to let her and her students come, right? So finally they relent and they're like, okay, fine. You can come to this one clinical lecture. Um, they go buy the little tickets and uh, someone brings the day before, someone brings them this little flyer that says, go tomorrow and see the she doctors. So the, the guys had found out that the women were coming and they were planning something, something was going down. Um, so they, they get there, they have to go in the back door. They're not allowed to go in the front door. Um, they come in and there's 300 guys waiting to, and they're just throwing stuff at them. They're, th you know, throwing tobacco spit, spitting on them. They're throwing tinfoil was and you know paper and screaming at them, stomping their feet, you know, yelling nasty nasty stuff you know calling them names saying nasty things about them it was you know it was bad they they didn't leave they sat this is like i think it's about like 10 of the women um but they sat they you know they tried to have the lecture the various administrators are coming in during this time and trying to get them to calm down you know stop we're trying to have a lecture here and you know at various points during the few hour lecture that you know they start you know the ruckus again they start screaming and stomping again and um, you know, they bring a patient in and like a part of his thigh, his upper thigh gets shown and oh, they have to start, you know, oh my gosh, these women are seeing this. This is terrible. Um, and at the end, they like, they're like chasing them out of the, you know, <laughs> running down the street after them. It was, it was crazy. I could not believe what these women went through just to get a medical education, just like men. I, I was shocked that this was how men were reacting and the women talk about they were shocked that this was how medical students were behaving like they couldn't imagine being treated having their daughters treated by these men that would do this to these women you know that's what they stressed was like why why this is why we're doing this because we want to be able to treat these women that they, they deserve better than this it's so breathtaking you know and it's hard to believe 1850 wasn't that long ago. i mean it was a long time ago <laughs> not that long ago, relatively speaking, in you know, the world of medical history, but it was so. All right. So you get this like this nugget from this clip, this experience you read. And then what did you decide to do? So then I, I keep digging and I find a riot almost exactly a year later that happened in Edinburgh, Scotland. And it was when Sophia and her the six other women at the university were going, they had been doing mostly women only classes. They had a few uh, mixed classes, um, but they they were had to go to an official exam, which was like all of the male students and all the women students that needed to take these certain exams in this year of school. So another, it, again, it was like planned that you know, the men were planning on making a ruckus. Um, there was hundreds of guys outside, not even just students. It was just like people from the town. Like this was like to the talk of the town was women attending medical school, right? It was like in the newspapers, people were debating it. It was a big deal. So 
these guys are drunk. Uh, they're they're yelling slurs at the women. They're throwing rocks and mud. Like their dresses are getting covered in mud. They're throwing rotten vegetables at them. Uh, yeah, it was bad. Uh, <laughs> poor women. They're just going to an exam. Same deal. They, they let a loose sheep into the exam room once the exam had started. It like owned to one of it was belonged to one of the uh, um, people at the university, like his pet or something. Um, so, and the professor inside said that the the sheep had more sense than the men outside did. So, um, but so same thing, they like follow them home. You know, they're chasing them down the streets. And there was a few of the male students that kind of acted as their, as their protectors, kind of thing, and were like, "Hey, you know, back off, you guys," kind of thing. So, you know, along the story, this isn't all you know, men versus women. There were definitely men along the way that there had to be, you know, there had to be those men who said, okay, there's no reason why you shouldn't do this. Let's do this. Or, you know, you have just as much right to be here as we do. So there were those few pockets that, you know, that's why they got as far as they did. They wouldn't have gone anywhere without, you know, some men that said, okay, let, let's try this. I mean, it's not surprising that we've only had the right to vote for a hundred years. <laughs> so, so how did the tide turn? How, what happened? I mean, it, it was a very long time before uh, women were actively allowed it, en, en masse into medical schools, into colleges. Um, this, these were considered experiments. Elizabeth Blackwell, the school she went to, they closed their doors to women after she left. This wasn't like, oh, this worked out, let's let's open up. They, they received such uh, vitriol from the medical establishment. They were like, oh no, we can't do this anymore. We can't handle this, this kind of spotlight. We're, we're not gonna let women in anymore. So it was, you know, it's a, it's a good and a bad thing. They, they were blazing the trail, but the, you know, doors were closing behind them. That they had opened. Same with um, with Lizzie. She the loophole that she got licensed through that that society promptly changed their wording to only allow men. You know, it was like a person or something like that was the wording before, and they they changed the wording to men only. So this is, you know, <laughs> they're realizing all their mistakes and letting these women in. Basically, they're like, oh, we didn't like this. For so. It, it, yes, it was good and bad. It was still a long, long way off. It was that they really had to prove that they could could do it, they could be doctors. That's what these first women, it was such a hard, so hard for them because of the spotlight on them to prove that they were so good at this, that they could actually do this. You know, um, they had to be the example cases that everyone was watching, people were talking about in medical journals. You know, there's, there's medical journal articles about Lizzie getting married, talking, you know, deciding whether or not that she'd be able to be a wife and mother and a physician, oh my gosh, imagine. Um, you know, these are conversations we've been having for, for hundreds of years. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, they, they, they was a very long road. That's why there was women's medical schools, because the men weren't ready yet. When, they, when women were pushing in, the men were not ready yet. And the, the goal for them to, to attend these regular schools that they knew, they realized when they were trying it themselves that that wasn't going to happen yet, that they, they didn't want to have to open women's medical schools. They wanted to go to the regular schools that were already there. Uh, they thought they had the right to, and they were like, okay, they realized that society wasn't ready yet. We're gonna open women's medical schools. We're gonna train ourselves. We're gonna be, you know, train as best as we can. We're gonna have incredible standards because, so we, you know, be totally beyond reproach in our skills because we're being held under the microscope constantly. Um, so that was it. It was that women having their own schools and going, you know, finally going out practicing and like just saying, okay, we can do this too. It's, you know, we're not too delicate. We're not just going to faint, you know, during a surgery, we can do this too. And yeah. And now, I mean, it's, it's not even a question. So what changed the tide? What was that moment where it went from that crazy to where we are today? I think it was, I don't think it was a moment. I think it was a really long push, honestly. Like, I think it was years of these women, you know, it was, oh God, it was really late that a lot of schools, it wasn't until like the fifties, I think that some schools didn't accept it. Like it was, it was bad. <laughs> like, um, I, I can't remember the exact school, but yeah, some schools were really resistant to the idea of, of women having any kind of education. And, you know, it, it took these initial women pushing and saying we should be allowed and the, the wider uh, push of the women's rights movement to just into education in general and like wanting to be allowed in colleges and then finally women's colleges 
came along kind of thing. So it was a, just a long, it was a long game. You know, they, they really just had to, to keep pushing forward. I don't think it was one moment of, oh, hey, we should open the, all the schools to women. It was years and years of saying, okay, finally, yes, they can do this. You know, a few women will trickle in here and there. And then they were like, finally, like, okay, yes, they, they, they can all come. <laughs> Wow. So a hundred years. I mean, right. It, yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> it makes sense that the suffragist movement took so long and so many yes. and just that we can have this right to vote. And I don't think most women think about that. Right. We just we assume that it's kind of always been cool for us or relatively cool um, and not so much, which women in white coats shows us the story of. So you are also equally badass. So tell us, tell our viewers, our audience about your career. What got you to this moment of writing this book? Uh, well, let's see. I used to be a ballet dancer. I started as a ballet dancer. I was uh, in the middle of my degree uh, to be, to get a dance degree. And I broke my foot and I thought, well, maybe I want a degree that's not so dependent on, you know, the wellness of my body being, you know, perfect all the time. So I decided to switch to journalism. Uh, so I switched majors and I started writing about dance. I started writing about the arts and theater and um, music and all kinds, you know, plays, all kinds of the arts. I was the arts editor of school paper. I loved it. So in my uh, junior year of college, I got pregnant unexpectedly. And uh, that brought me into a whole different world of, of writing and, you know, having a difficult pregnancy and having a difficult birth, having postpartum depression, all of these things made me realize I wanted to start writing about women's medicine, um, maternal medicine, that kind of thing. So I have three kids now, but my husband, is, who's the father of all of them, <laughs> we're, we're still together incredibly, um, but, <laughs> you know, it, it was, it was really a difficult time. And I wanted to know why I wasn't prepared for it. Why I wasn't, you know, reading more about it. Why wasn't there more for me to read about it? So I wanted to be that voice for, for women talking about, you know, talking openly about postpartum depression, talking openly about uh, traumatic births, that kind of thing. So it kind of started out writing service pieces and essays about women's health and women's medicine. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of blossomed from there to talk about all different kinds of, of science and history. Um, I try to combine, my favorite thing of course, is to combine science, women and history. Um, that's, that's really my passion uh, is, is that little niche of, women have been doing this for a lot longer than we think, um, you know, unearthing those little, little stories of these women from hundreds of years ago that uh, were doing things we, we had no idea that they were doing so, so long ago really amazing isn't it what we don't know and how women are just so resilient right I mean we push these humans out of us and it's like the best thing I ever did twice and I, I have respect for people who kept doing it right so so what is it that you would love us to know women everywhere what does Olivia want all of us to know um I think my my hope for with this book that the main the major takeaway I wanted everyone to have was that sexism was never okay like it, as long, like we love to say, oh, that's how it was back then. You know, it was a different time. It was acceptable. And yes, there were definitely women that embraced the, you know, anti-feminist ideals of the time. For sure. There are women in, in the book are like, oh my gosh, I would never go to a woman doctor. Are you crazy? They don't know what they're doing. You know? Um, so yes, there, there was that sentiment among some women, but overall, as long as there have been people discriminating against women there have been women saying no this is not okay it's, it's never really been okay it's just that you know <laughs> that that's my biggest takeaway and that women have been doing medicine a lot lot longer than we think you know there in the research for this book there you know women were being surgeons in, in ancient egypt ancient greece you know they 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 were at it long before <laughs> you know in africa and in, in Asia, all over, women were giving medical care. And the more I research women in medical care, the more I see how much of a footprint that, that is there if you really look for it, because they weren't officially labeled a physician, maybe on their death certificate, that kind of thing. They weren't, they didn't have that official label of an MD or a license, but they, they were still giving, making medicines in their home. They were, you know, practicing medicine with other families, that kind of thing. It's, it's really, it's there if you look for it. And it's, it's really fascinating to me. 
No, it's beautiful. And I'm so happy that you've done this work and so happy to know you and promote you um, because I want everyone to know this. You know, when you look back at the American Revolution, a lot of people that lived in this country didn't think it was a good idea. <laughs> right. So, and so it's not surprising that this is just kind of like whatever the popular thing is that people follow suit, but there are those trailblazers. So last question, what would you like us to do? Women everywhere, what can we do to support each other? Um, I, I think I, I think men and women can both uh, really try to, there's still sexism in medicine. I think that's my, my big issue currently um, is, you know, a woman walks in the room, you're in your hospital and you think she's the nurse, right? That's still the standard for some people. Um, I, I just want everyone to understand that women are just as capable. There was just a research study. This is one, one in the line of many. This was new research study um, last month that women are better surgeons. Like um, women patients and men patients of women surgeons are less likely to die in the next 30 days than if they had a male surgeon. Like <laughs> are women better because they have to be better? Like do they, you know, they're, they're competing and they have to show they're better. But, you know, trust, trust women that, they know what they're doing and they're just as capable as men, if not more so because they've been pushed aside for so long. Don't underestimate women. Well, I think we'll end on that beautiful sentiment, right? Don't, don't underestimate us. Olivia Campbell, Women in White Coats, available at Costco. You are the featured Penny's Pick this month and you are the cover story of Incandescent Women Magazine and featured on Incandescent Women radio and incandescent TV. Thank you so much for your time. I am so honored to know you and meet you and to share your beautiful work with the world. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. It's so great. All right, everybody, go get that book. And we're gonna have much more from Olivia. Check out incandescentwomen.com, March, April issue, because she's gonna share her liner notes for book clubs and so many other things. So women can do it. Don't underestimate us. <laughs> Thank you all for listening. We'll see you soon. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs with Incandescent Everything. <laughs> we'll talk to you soon.